I'd like to welcome Adam Harvey to give us a little talk this afternoon. Could you all please make him very welcome? Thank you very much. Um, I will start with a couple of quick housekeeping points. Um, I will take questions at the end, but if you feel desperately compelled to heckle, please feel free to during the talk. <laughs> Additionally, um, the lights are really bright and I actually can't see about half of you, so you will have to yell if you desperately need to ask a question during the talk, because I probably won't see your hand go up. So, I am Adam Harvey. I am giving a talk on non-cryptographic hashing. Uh, I work for a company called New Relic. We do performance monitoring and analytics stuff, and this talk really isn't related to much of that, so that's good. So, what is a non-cryptographic hash. And this is going to be revision for a lot of you, but just so we're all on the same page, let's start with this. Well, let's start with what a hash function is. A hash function takes some arbitrary data and gives you a number out the other end based on that data. Now, when we say hash functions, what we tend to think of as developers are MD5, SHA-1, various SHAs, various other hash functions that we use all the time. They underpin things like SSL, block encryption, password storage, and pretty much every other thing that we take for granted in terms of making the internet secure and hopefully having you know, not too many scary LCA talks each year. Those are cryptographic hash functions. They have specific qualities that make them cryptographic. They make it as difficult as possible to generate collisions, so having different types of data that generate the same hash value. And they make it as difficult as possible to work backwards to figure out what the input was. And then you have key derivation functions, which take those and then extend those for use with passwords. For example, bcrypt uses the blowfish block cipher in conjunction with a basic hashing function to hopefully make it extremely hard for people to get your password when every SAS service ever accidentally leaks them. But there are also non-cryptographic hash functions. There's a place for functions that are fast and have good distribution properties, but provide no guarantee of security. You can use them when you need values, and they are designed to be fast, minimize memory usage, and as I said, hopefully distribute values. So why would you use these? Well, the most common case is probably hash tables. If you're writing C code or some other low-level language and your standard library was finalized and ossified somewhere in the 70s, then you may actually have to implement your own hash table. So the general way you do that is you have some sort of key, you take a hash of that, and in that case, you're not really interested in security. Like, that doesn't matter. I mean, you, you don't care whether it's secure. What you do care about is that the values that you bring in are distributed and so that you don't end up putting everything into a single bucket. Another, another use is to look at what you've seen before, things like message digests, looking at lists of things that, where you're, you have to do some sort of post-processing on stuff, and you may or may not have already seen it. It's a very quick way of basically determining whether you need to do additional work. Validity. I mean, normally you'd use cryptographic hashes for checksumming, but there are scenarios, again, message digests being one of them, where you really just want like a modern parity bit, effectively. So it's a good way of just, they can be a way of just verifying that, hey, that's useful or valid. Interoperability is not really a use case, but every now and then people spec really dumb things. For example, at a company that appeared on the first slide, we recently had a standard that was developed for interaction between teams that basically used non-cryptographic hashing because somebody thought non-cryptographic hashing was cool. So knowing how they work gives you at least some background there. And I don't know, maths can be fun, so I'm told anyway. I don't feel like I have to explain that one at this conference, which is nice. So let's say that you want a non-cryptographic hashing function. How would you do it? Well, let's start with some goals. You want it to be fast, and you want it to distribute the output well so that you don't have stuff sitting in the same buckets. As I said, hash tables are one of the key uses for this. Um, and in that scenario, particularly if you're doing something like a chained hash table where the buckets are actually linked lists, if you start putting stuff into the same buckets, then all of a sudden you have a lot of things in a linked list that you have to walk when you need to go look for something or when you need to add something. That's a problem. That makes it slow. So you don't want clumps in your output. And ideally you want it to be across your entire value space. 
Well, how this is referred to is the avalanche effect. So if you've got data that's coming in that doesn't vary a ton, it's only, say, varying in a couple of significant digits, you don't really want it to only affect a couple of digits out the other end because you don't have much space to put stuff in at that point. You want each change to have a bigger effect on the data. This is called the avalanche effect. So you want small changes to basically add up to big things. You can think of it like the butterfly flapping its wings and there being flooding in Geelong kind of, kind of scenario. Hash functions in general are structured in a very standard way. They start off with some sort of initial state, which is actually not on this slide, so that was good work on my part. Then you look at chunks of data, which could be bytes, could be words, could be some other block size. You perform some sort of cleverness, and the cleverness is actually a mixing function in the literature, which basically takes the current state, does something with the data that's coming in, and then you get another value out the end. So, in ge generally speaking, cryptographic hash functions use a particular construction, which I will now mangle because it's Danish, called merkel damgor construction, which adds padding in a specific way, but is basically just a fancy way of saying this. So just because they got their names on it doesn't make it complicated. So what sorts of things do you do that are actually clever in that cleverness function? You're generally dealing with unsigned fixed length integers. Now, this is actually important. Generally, a hash function specifies, well, all hash functions specify that the output will be 32 bits or 64 bits or whatever value it is that you're interested in, whatever size it is you're interested in. Usually, they rely very heavily on the way overflow operations work in practice. So if you have a 32-bit hash value and you multiply it and it goes beyond 32 bits, it, they generally rely on the fact that you're going to throw away the high bits beyond 32. So those are important. Bitwise operations get used heavily, exclusive ORs and bit shifts generally, and multiplication is used to basically shuffle values along. And again, this is basically because we're trying to get that avalanche effect. We want to affect all the bits, not just the ones that are changing in the inputs. So as I said, integer overflow is a big thing. If you have that value and you add that value, pretty much all CPUs will give you zero. This is one of those things that languages Low-level languages usually don't spec. The spec is usually along the lines of, well, whatever the processor does is probably right. So a lot of this is just based on convention, which is a little unfortunate. There are usually a bunch of primes as constants that you'll see in most of the examples we look at, and this is for bucketing behavior. If you end up with, if you're doing multiplications or you're doing bit shifts with common buckets or with non-prime values, then you end up with common factors. And common factors basically end up meaning that you put more stuff in the same buckets. And that results in badness. For an example, if your hash function is biased towards multiples of eight, and you're implementing something with eight buckets, you might have just put everything in one hash bucket. And congratulations, you just implemented a linked list with added overhead. So let's look at a really simple example to start with. FNV1A is a, the second revision, because naming is hard, of, a, of an algorithm that was originally called FNV0. It was created in 1991 by Glenn Fowler, Landon Kurtnoll, and Fong Vo, and later revised because it didn't actually avalanche very well. It's still used in a lot of places today. Um, for example, PHP still uses it for its real path cache. I mean, not that I'm saying PHP is a good example of how to do things, but the point is it is used in practice. And it's simple enough that we can basically see how it fa factors into that pseudocode slash Python 3.5 example I showed earlier. This is how you implement FNV1A, the 32-bit version anyway, in C. This is the entire thing. So conceptually, it's really simple. There's an initial state, which is the hash. There is, then we loop over each byte, because it's a byte-wise algorithm. We exclusive or the hash value with the byte value, and then we multiply it. There are a lot of magic numbers in here, and this is a very common thing in hash functions, both cryptographic and non-cryptographic. There are constants all over the place that are used to basically avalanche the, the data. This, the constants in the old days tended to just be picked by hand. Nowadays, what tends to happen is that the developers of these algorithms will basically run simulations with lots and lots of different values, get the computer to pick some random values and see what basically generates the best output. I think this predates that. I think these were pretty much just picked. 
So let's walk through it and just see how it works if we give it two bytes. A, B in ASCII. Left to right, not right to left. First we set it to a randomly select first we set the hash to a randomly selected number. And this was what the first version, FNV0, didn't actually have. Now this number's not a prime. It's not chosen to actually disperse stuff as such. It's just a non-zero value, so that there's some initial state. The value itself is actually the FNV0 hash of the email signature of one of the authors. It works. And you can see in practice, I mean, about half of the values are ones and about half of the bits are zero. And that's actually a good thing. That, that means that there's a fair bit of like initial fuzziness. This is a very scientific talk, as you can tell. <laughs> OK, so we've got the hash value. So now we iterate over the bytes. The first byte is an A. Probably way too many people in this room, like me, know that that binary actually is lowercase a in ASCII. So byte gets set to that. So first we're going to do the exclusive or. Now you can see, there we go, you can see those bytes there, or those bits, I'm sorry, they're changed. So only three bits actually changed to start with. It's kind of a problem. It's not good for the bucketing, like we were saying. But then we multiply. Now, if you know your, your powers of two, which I'm sure everybody in this room does. The pri that prime value is close to, but not identical to, two to the power of 20, two to the 24. Effectively, what this is, is we're doing a bit shift, but there's a bit of added noise in the lower bits. So what this has done is it shifted it, but there's also some additional changes that have happened because we, it's not exactly the prime. And all of a sudden we've changed, what's that? About 11 bits, I think in the 32-bit value. So all of a sudden, we've taken a very small change and turned it into a bigger change. Now, it's predictable, but again, this is non-cryptographic. It doesn't really matter if we know what the state was in the intervening points, because we're just trying to get something that's good out the other end. Then we'll repeat the same thing for B. So in this case, there, it's only two bits different to the A, of course, because it's the, the following one. Again, only three bits change when we do the exclusive OR. But once we do the multiplication, again, the changes have happened all over the place. Every nibble has had at least one, and in most cases, two bits modified from the initial state. So we've already changed a lot, and the, where, which bucket we're going to choose if we're using this for, say, a hash table has suddenly changed significantly. So this is one function. As I said, this is a very simple one, but it's still used in a lot of places. But this is but one option. Because people are creative and they have too much time on their hands, for example, they develop talks like this, people create their own hash functions all over the time, all over the place. So let's look at some of the common functions. Now, these are common functions that are used all over the place. I'm going to compare and contrast some differences as we go. And we're going to look at basically how good they are in terms of speed and how good they are at distributing their output. And we're going to look at 32-bit versions only, mostly just to keep the comparison apples to apples. So how do we actually judge this? Well, speed is, I think, fairly obvious. Distribution is a little less obvious. Now, distribution, we can look at how many collisions there are and basically use that as a proxy for how well distributed. So a collision is when we have multiple things in our inputs that generate the same value in the outputs. So what we need to do is we need to test it with a variety of inputs. So I've tested, for each of the algorithms we're going to look at, there are three inputs. The first is a words file from a well-known Unix distribution which does not have a penguin as its logo. This is a good test for collisions, and it's also a really good test for performance because most of the inputs are short. I mean, the average length of, the word, of a, a line in the words file is probably only about half a dozen bytes. And of course, if you're implementing a hash table, which is, again, the most common use, chances are your inputs are going to be pretty small for the most part. It depends on what you're doing, of course. But in a lot of cases, they'll be quite small. The next input is numbers. In actual fact, it's a file of numbers from 0 to 235, 885 to make it the exact same size as the words input. This is particularly interesting for collisions because there's even less entropy in the numbers set. It's only ever going to be 0 to 9. So there's only 10 possible characters that are coming in as input. And finally, to test the performance alone, I've taken the complete Sherlock Holmes canon and used each adventure or novel as a separate input. 
This doesn't tell us anything interesting in terms of collisions, but it does tell us what the performance is like for larger inputs, because some algorithms, as we're going to see, are better optimised for larger inputs than smaller, which then affects where you might choose to use them. Okay, so let's look at FNV1A. We already looked at it in detail, so let's just look at the results. At this point, the numbers are pretty opaque, but from here on, I'll compare everything else to FNV1A as a baseline for each input. The collisions are actually pretty low for FNV1A, which suggests that the output's reasonably well distributed. Um, we would expect some collisions for the... If we have over 200,000 inputs, which we do for both numbers and words, and we're only getting a 32-bit value out the other end, and you factor in the birthday paradox, there is basically a greater than 75% chance of a collision for a naive hash function. Um, please don't ask me to prove the maths. I, I have a film degree. This is... Just trust me on this. I got someone to check it. They said that was correct. Another way that we can visualise it, which doesn't work so well on a projection screen, is to basically map out the results across the, result, the possible result space. I have completely stolen this approach from a, a man named Ian Boyd, who basically used this in a Stack Overflow answer. Now, the black bits, or the black dots, the increasingly grey dots, I should rephrase, are basically the number of values in each, in each area of the, of the search space. White dots are unused values in the output. So basically, you want this to look like noise, effectively. And this one looks pretty much like noise. It's kind of grey. It looks like, you know, analogue TV back in the day when channels shut down at night. And it's pretty good. If I kind of squint at it, I almost feel like I can see something, but I think that's just because humans are adapted to pattern matching and we see patterns where there aren't. So let's look at something that's not technically a non-cryptographic hash, but you can use like one anyway, which is CRC32, which is such an old and common algorithm that many CPUs actually have this built in. There's a CRC, there's seriously a CRC instruction on a whole bunch of architectures. Dates from 1961, and it's also byte-wise. CRC is interesting because it's actually ridiculously simple. Like it makes FNV1A look like an over-engineered blob. The key difference is that there is a table of inputs. There is a table of 256 32-bit integers that come in as inputs that get used to help mix. The mathematics... This basically is done for extra mixing. The mathematics that are actually happening underneath are really interesting. This is basically a completely deconstructed way of doing a binary long division with a polynomial uh, because of the way the multiplication works. I am, again, not going to get into the finer details because that would basically be most of this talk, but it's very cool. The important thing is that it's also, considering its age, very effective. It's a little bit slower than FNV1A, but not a lot. It has a few more collisions for the words, but not a lot. And it's pretty good for a byte-wise algorithm. Now, if we look at how well distributed the output is, it's not obvious on that screen, but it's kind of obvious on mine that there is some clumping. There's kind of an interesting herringbone pattern in there. Now, our inputs, now the tests that I ran and the inputs that we're using didn't really show that. So this is where the collisions kind of fall down a little bit. And that's why, ultimately, I mean, you're going to need to actually look at what your inputs are, what kind of inputs you have, and how well distributed you need the output to be. And there are multiple ways to judge that. So, let's look at a more modern one. There are a whole family of more modern non-cryptographic hashes that have been developed in the last five to ten years. One of them is Murmahash 3. As the name indicates, this actually is the third iteration of Murmahash, as opposed to FNV. Apparently, semantic versioning was now a thing. It's the third revision of a function designed by Austin Appleby, and the name was, in, was inspired by two basic operations, and the only two it really uses, which are multiplication and rotation. You can all read that, right? That's, that's easy. It's not actually that bad, because conceptually, the structure is no, not really any different to what we've already talked about. So let's just break it down, because this is a good example and a relatively simple example of one more modern generation of hashing functions. So firstly, we have a prototype. It takes a seed, a 32-bit seed. A lot of modern hash functions are initialized with seeds. The reason for this is it makes it harder to predict where collisions can occur and how collisions can occur. And an example of why this matters, again, I will come back to PHP. So PHP, if you pass in um, a, a set of get or post parameters, will basically put them into associative arrays, which are basically hash tables with nicer syntax, and then you will get to access them. Now, 
In PHP until January 2012, there were no limits on how many values you could pass in. PHP also did not use a random seed for the hashing. So what that meant was you could actually pre-compute what things would generate collisions in PHP's hash table engine and then cause a massive denial of service attack because ultimately you could put everything into one bucket and then force PHP to walk the linked list every single time it mutated that array. Which meant, in effect, you could basically take down any PHP website which didn't have some sort of web server configuration in front to try and cut down on the number of parameters that came in by basically making the CPU on the server spin and spin and spin and spin and spin, and spin as it walked the arrays over and over and over and over and over again. So randomly generating a seed is important for that kind of scenario because it's a very cheap way. It doesn't have to be particularly random. It just has to be a different value each time. Ra Putting in a different value each time makes it much easier to avoid that kind of thing. So once again, once we're in the implementation, we define a bunch of constants which get used over and over. We set up an initial hash value, this time from the seed rather than hard coding one like we did in FNV. And then unlike FNV and CRC32, which operate on bytes, Mermahash 3 operates on 32-bit words. This is pretty common. Um, we're going to see some other functions that use actually bigger blocks than that. The reason for that, of course, is that modern CPUs generally prefer to do things in that way. They're going to, they prefer to take words at a time. They will do read-ahead things. They will do things with caching. Uh, you have aligned access con considerations, so you really do want to be pulling stuff in in words. What you can see there is Trailing bytes, if you have, say, a 17-byte input, you're only going to deal with 16 bytes in this loop, and we'll see what happens after that. There's a bunch of rotations and some multiplications. So pretty much as advertised, there are multiplications and rotates. Once we're done, we have the tail, which we then interpret basically as a set of bytes. And from there, there's basically a, a slightly different way of handling each possible length of the tail, because you know they have one, two, or three bytes trailing. And this is pretty common, um, that you would look at that and then you would do extra work if there's two or three bytes, and then eventually you combine it all into the hash. There's an intermediate hash that effectively gets calculated from the, the one to three trailing bytes, and then it get, gets mixed into the main hash. If there are no trailing bytes, then just none of this happens. Now, at the end, you do some po it does some post-processing. This is, again, really common in newer hash functions. If you choose your values carefully, and again, usually you do it by kind of having a search space and running lots and lots of iterations and seeing what works better, then you can use this to, in in to introduce additional avalanching. There is a catch, though. If you choose your values badly, you might actually make it worse. Murmur hash is actually OK, but we might see one or two later that have that problem. There are a few more collisions, which sucks. It's a little bit slower than FNV 1A for byte-wise, because it's doing a bit more work. But you'll note that all of a sudden, on the home's input, which is much larger, it is way quicker, because it, it basically can load four bytes at a time. It does operations on those, and it works much better with the way that modern CPUs generally operate. I ran these benchmarks, actually, on this laptop. It's an x86 laptop, so all the read-ahead stuff works much better in this case. And the distribution, it looks like noise. It's good. Another one is XXHash, which has been, its website proudly proclaims, has been adopted by a number of projects, including PFSense and TeamViewer. It does not actually say what it gets used for in those. It has a similar construction to Mermahash 3, except it reads 16 bytes at a time. Again, it's too big. I'm not actually going to go through this one in full detail, but let's look at the interesting bits. So. We start by setting up four values. Now, this one's interesting. Although in the end we're still getting a single value out, unlike the hash functions we've already seen, it actually, tr it actually keeps effectively four running hashes as it goes based on, the, based on the each four byte set of the 16 byte blocks that we're looking at. It also defines a bunch of primes, five of them in total, and we use two of them just to set up the initial state, and it takes a seed. For each 16 byte block, as I said, we take basically four bytes at a time from that block, and then it mixes each of them together into these intermediate hashes. So it calls this thing called xxhash32mix, which, again, is just a multiplication and a rotation and an addition, or two rotations, I should say, and a bitwise all. 
So it's doing the same thing for each of them. It's just that the initial values were different. If we go back, they were different. What we do to each of the chunks is therefore a little bit different because our state is different. And hopefully that means that we get sort of different types of hashing happening, or at least different bucketization happening for depending on which where in the 16-byte input chunks the value, our bits are, basically. And then we add everything together. We do some more rotations. In the case that it's less than 16 bytes of input to start with, there is actually a separate initialization case. And in this case, it basically falls back to being something more like Murmur hash in terms of it becomes a four byte chunk hashing algorithm and then has whatever is trailing that gets hashed in. Again, we do some post-processing and you're probably starting to note now that everything looks pretty similar because if you remember the pseudocode way back at the start of the talk, everything really is pretty similar. We have an initial state, we do some cleverness with, different ch with each chunk and then we do some post-processing in the newer ones and we get hashes. Now, because we're reading 16 bytes at a time, this one is insanely fast for larger inputs. So all of a sudden, it's almost an order of magnitude quicker than FNV1A and FNV1A is not that bad to start with. And the distribution is indeed pretty good. All right, we'll pick up the pace even more now. CityHash was developed by Google. It's based on an early version of MurmurHash, actually the first version of MurmurHash. And it was probably the progenitor for a bunch of the other, I guess, modern generation of hash functions. CityHash has three different um, output sizes, 32, 64, and 128 bit. At the time, the fact that it could generate a 128 bit hash was relatively unusual. Now it's much more common. Again, we'll only look at the 32-bit version here. Now, the 32-bit version is interesting. It reads 20-byte blocks. 20 bytes is kind of a funny one. It's a kind of a funny number. It was chosen to optimize the read-ahead caching with, I believe, the size of the SSE pipeline on x86 CPUs at the time it was being developed, which was about six to eight years ago. It does a little bit more work per block, but of course it's reading more at a time as well, so that's, that's okay, it's not an issue. So let's look at how it does. Now, I'm running this on a much more modern CPU. I mean, obviously recognizably the same, but a, a newer CPU than the one it was developed against. The interesting part here is, it's reading more at a time, it's optimized for the way read-ahead caching worked. You would expect it to be quicker on, la on the large input than the pr than anything else we've looked at, XX hash being the last one we looked at, it's actually a few percent slower. That's interesting because what that implies is that it may have been overfitted to the CPUs that were in use at the time. And that's why, again, you need to actually do your own testing because environment matters, basically. Question. Yeah. That, if you want to shout, I will. <laughs> oh, no, hang on. Yes, Trent. Uh, in the CPU time column, mm -hmm. the Holmes, is that actually 0.68 milliseconds or is that like an order of magnitude up? Um, so I thought that was the biggest input and it seems it's been consistent so far that that was like a much smaller number. So is that like 0.68 seconds or? Let me go back and see. Because they're all sort of like that. Yeah, um, so it was originally milliseconds. I actually ran them multiple, I, there's more, more than one iteration here basically. Um, right. So the, test, the testing matrix for this was I actually ran them 100 times. Each okay. time and then and so is it actually faster on these the super large Holmes input than the smaller ones, or is that just a quirk of the testing iterations? Um, mostly a quirk of the testing iterations. Okay. So it's yeah. Right. Yeah. The numbers are consistent against each other, um, but I mean the, the input sets are so different that it doesn't really make sense to compare them directly to each other. Few collisions. Um, looks like noise. All right. Well, good hash functions are boring. Let's look at one that's less less good. So there's a website which used to exist called non-crypto hash zoo and it basically looked at as many hashing functions as it could. I will quote what the author of that said, super fast hash is the quintessential example of how easy it is to go wrong when you're making your own hash function even if you're incredibly smart. Now again, you can't read that but that's okay. There is something missing from this though and I can't really put it on the next slide because if it was there, I, you know, if it's missing, I can't really show you an absence of something. It has no initial state. So it's repeated the same mistake that FNV0 had 25 years ago. The actual mixing function um, operates on 
four byte chunks that handles the high and low 16 bits separately. So it's kind of like what we saw with XX hash, where depending on where a set of, a set of bits are in the input, they get, to, they get dealt with differently. There are some gymnastics around bit shifting. There is one interesting bit here, though, which is that the left and right shifts in the mixing function are by the same amount, which is unusual. I wonder if that'll come back to bite them. Trailing bytes are handled differently based on the size. As I said, that tends to be a thing that happens. Then at the end, there's a ton of mixing that happens in the post-processing, or a ton of, sorry, rotation bit shifts that happen in the post-processing, which is unusual. Usually, you'd have a mixture of operations taking place here. I would hypothesize, not having ever corresponded with the author, that probably this was because initial iterations of this algorithm actually didn't distribute their output very well. And this was an attempt to deal with that. The problem, of course, is because we've had the same rotation amounts in the mixing function and because we didn't have an initial state beyond zero, the four-byte loop that we saw two slides ago has often already collapsed into the same values. So the hash is actually getting changed by similar amounts each time. So if you have an input that has a lot of very similar things, for example, numbers, what happens? Turns out you get an awful lot of collisions. In actual fact, over 10% of the numbers input collides into the same values. I'm not even going to talk about the speed because it's not really, not really terribly relevant here. If you look at the distributed output, it looks pretty nice except for that dark line on the right-hand side. That's probably an issue. <laughs> it could be worse. This is a different hashing function. I won't dob in the person who wrote it, but I will tell a quick anecdote about why this matters. So I work on the PHP agent at New Relic. It's a C extension. It has to work on a bunch of different operating systems and a bunch of different architectures. So it's basically written in C89, which is obviously a ton of fun to be writing in 2016. What that means is the standard library is basically non-existent. There's very basic stuff, but we have to be able to track a lot of key value data because all of the teams that we interoperate with are operating in much higher level languages with nice data types. So we get a lot of JSON hashes and we have to deal with them. So we have an internal hash table implementation. Um, of course, rolling your own data structures is always a good idea. And that hash table implementation used this algorithm as the hashing function. So our code is basically a profiler. Um, at some point, we decided to profile the profiler. And it turned out that we were spending 0.2% of our execution time just hashing key values and looking up, or just hashing keys and looking up the values in the hash tables because they were collapsing into basically the same, I think it was like only 5% of buckets ever got used. So this was kind of a problem. So we switched and we immediately got a speed up that was statistically significant. That's good, because we're trying to minimize overhead when you're writing a profiler, right? So let's talk about some conclusions. Firstly, know your environment. Murmurhash 3 and XXHash smoke every other algorithm when they're implemented in C and C++ because they exploit how CPUs behave when you're, writing it, when you're working at that level. But if you implement them in a higher level language like Python or Ruby or whatever, you lose all of that because the runtime has to go back and do other stuff between executing each of the steps in the loop. So you've just killed it. Why would you bother? So you have to know your environment. You also have to, as I said, for the example of city hash, the exact CPU revision can matter because the caching behavior changed. So you need to know your environment. You need to respect your standard library. If you're in a language where there is a hashing function available or a hash table implementation available and you don't have to roll your own, don't roll your own. Because, for example, in Python, the quickest non-cryptographic hashing function you can use in the standard library is CRC32. Never mind how much quicker all the others were, it's because the CRC32 implementation is written in C. That's it. Less work, faster, and you didn't have to write anything. Know your inputs. XX hash makes compromises that don't make sense if your average input is small. I mean, we saw how much better it was at large inputs, but it's actually slower at the small inputs. And in actual fact, if you're using small inputs for the word corpus, it turns out everything's pretty much the same speed. Why wouldn't you? You might as well just implement the simplest one that is well distributed enough, which is probably FNV1A. For large inputs, on the other hand, 
it's worth the time to implement a more, a more complicated one because XX hash, Murmur hash, city hash, which are the ones on the right, are considerably faster. And finally, know your requirements. Understand how many collisions you're willing to bear. You know, implementing a simpler function is fine if you know that your input data sets are going to be pretty small and it doesn't really matter if you're going to have some collisions because you're not in a speed dependent environment or your requirements involve very small inputs. And of course, you'd want to consider complexity of, in, of the implementation. You know, XX hash, city hash, they're potentially more robust depending on your use case, but they're also a lot harder to actually implement assuming you can't just reuse the code that's available. If you can reuse the code that's available, then that doesn't really come into it. With that, we come to the end. Thank you very much, and I would love to take some questions, comments, heckling, etc. Question is: Is it, uh, have I done performance tests with cryptographic hashing functions? Um, yes, I have. Generally, you're looking at an, at another. I was going to say order of magnitude. It's not actually an order of magnitude, but it's a significant. There is a significant difference, basically. But the non-cryptographic functions make a lot of compromises. They are generally considerably quicker than the cryptographic functions, even the really fast cryptographic functions. But of course, the de the downside is your output is you know not useful if you're doing password hashing or something like that. So yes, they are they are quicker. Is the the very short answer. <laughs> Have I looked at the hash functions identified by gperf, um, the perfect hashing functions? I have. Um, it, they were my, I haven't looked at it for a few months. I'm trying to remember what the conclusion was now. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, those are the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you need to know the inputs more, more deeply for those, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically that would be a case where, yes, if you know your inputs on the way in, then it's good because you know you'll have better distribution, and performance-wise I think they were comparable, but the catch is you have to know your inputs on the way in. If you're dealing with arbitrary JSON data coming from a web service, then <laughs> good luck, basically. That's not going to help you. Awesome. Thank you again. <laughs>